Good morning, everybody. Welcome to everybody watching online. If you're over on West Side, I hope you enjoyed the live band this morning. This is, my name's Pete. Did I already say that? I do, I do this twice, so I sometimes I forget. My name's Pete. I'm one of the pastors here, and someone up here is so friendly saying, hi, Pete. So nice, so nice. This, this is Super Sunday. It's a, it's a one-off. It's a kickoff to the church year. All these things are beginnings. The school year is beginning. So many ministries are restarting. And my goal this morning is to remind you of what the church is and the beauty that the church is. Is the, the beautiful entity that she could and will be. What is church? Is it this? Is it this Sunday morning thing? The culture might think so. When people talk about Christians, they maybe think those are the people that they do a thing on Sunday morning. There's a thing, but then after the thing that they do on Sunday morning, they're just like the rest of us. They just sit on the couch all day and watch the NFL, right? That's what we're all really thinking about, right? How long is it going to take to get my kids ice cream, bouncy castle, then I got to get to the games, right? Okay. Maybe the world would look at us that way. And perhaps the danger for us as followers of Jesus, or maybe some of you are thinking about becoming followers of Jesus, the danger would be to think that this is it, that Sunday is what it's all about, and while a Sunday gathering has always been and will always be central to what it means to be the church, to be followers of Jesus, to really be the church, we must go beyond Sunday. There has to be more than just Sunday. And so I want to unpack a little bit about what it means to be the church, to be followers of Jesus. And I want to begin with a familiar word for many of us, Christ like. It is the target that we hope to lead people into, that they are becoming more and more Christ-like, which is a very churchy word. I agree, Christ-like. In fact, you'll often hear me say, Jesus-like, because I think it's easier to get on board with, oh, I can imagine Jesus. I know what Jesus did. I hear stories about Jesus. The goal is to be like Jesus. And so why do we use this, this Christ-like? It feels so, so churchy. Well, Jesus-like is good. Christ-like, though, contains some other elements to it. And let me give you one that's really important. The word Christ means anointed one. It means anointed one. And when you anoint someone in the, in the time that this word comes from, the idea would be that you would anoint them with oil and that they would become a mediator, so to speak, between the spiritual and the material, between the God realm and the human realm. They become like a thin, a thin space, so to speak. And so, so who would be traditionally anointed? You would anoint the king, because you anoint the king because the king is basically like God among us. Like he is, he is as close to God as you can get. He's God's representative among us. And so you anoint the king, because hopefully he is that thin space. You would anoint priests. Priests, because yeah, priests are the mediators between us and God performing sacrifices on our behalf. You anoint priests because, because they are, they are this, this thin space. You would anoint prophets. Another word for prophet is just messenger because they're bringing messages, messages from the spiritual world, from the God space, from the heavenly realms into our material, physical world. Christ-like means to be those who are anointed in a similar way. One word that I've found helpful when you think about those who are anointed, kings, prophets, priests, is that they are like portals. They're like portals that, that, that bring the life of heaven, the life of the space that God inhabits, they bring that life into our world. And so at least in part, what it means to be Christ-like is to become a portal for the life of heaven to begin to flood into the life of the world. But that definition only gets us to a functional definition. That's kind of like, well, that's, that's what we are to be. Like we are to be portals. But, but what about the character of what is supposed to be coming through this portal? Well, that's where Jesus-like helps us. Because Christ-like doesn't just mean be a portal. It means be the portal like Jesus was. Bring his character into the world. Follow after him and be like him. 
And when Jesus taught what it would mean to be Christ-like, to be his followers, to be like him, he taught in such a way that there is one marker that would never get lost. There is one marker that, that when you think Christian, you will never be able to think it without this thing attached to it. And if this thing is not attached to it, then whatever you're talking about is not a Christian, is not a follower of Jesus. And that's what I wanna look at today. When Jesus was a little boy, he was a Jewish little boy who would grow up to be a Jewish rabbi. And at the center of the Jewish faith is a famous prayer called the Shema. Jesus would have learned this as a young boy and begun to pray it every day, possibly twice a day. And when he woke up and when he went to bed, he would pray the Shema. And the Shema sounds like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Jesus would have grown up with this prayer and it would have been on his lips every day of his life. This prayer emphasizes that we should love God that we should have a vertical relationship, like we should love God. And how do you love God? By obeying his laws, by obeying the Torah. This would have been so familiar to Jesus and everybody that Jesus interacted with, all of the Jewish people that he interacted with. Which is why it is so stark when he gives an answer to a religious expert that is slightly different than this central prayer of Judaism. One day Jesus is debating with Sadducees who are a type of Jewish religious person. And they're debating about marriage. And somebody else, like somebody else who's a teacher of the law, they overhear this and they're impressed with Jesus' debating about this issue. And so they come up to him and they ask, of all the commandments, which is the most important? This was a common question that you would ask a rabbi because there's so many commands in the Torah, over 600 of them, that you would ask a rabbi, as you see it, if you were to start to build a foundation, if you were to start to teach someone how to be like you, where would you start? Like, what's the most important one? And the way that you answered this would kind of tell people would-be disciples whether or not they wanted to follow you or not. And so this is a common question this guy asks. If, uh, of all the commandments, what's the most important the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. If you're paying attention, we just read this. What is this? It's the, it's the opening of the Shema, which would have made the person asking the question and everyone listening in, oh, okay, we know this Jesus guy's a little crazy. He does and says some crazy things. At least... He's on board with like the central command being the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Pretty much the same. He just adds mind in there. We can, okay, that's okay. No big deal. He just added mind. It's fine. And then Jesus will make what will become the hallmark of his revolution, the hallmark of his kingdom, the hallmark of coming to understand who he is and he will make an addition to the Shema. Scott McKnight calls this the Jesus Creed, that when you're coming to be, a, begin, to be a follower of Jesus, you're like, what is like the beginning of this? He's like, it begins with the first part of the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now, this language is not foreign to the Jewish religion. This language is actually taken from the book of Leviticus, which I know is all your favorite book. You read it diligently. No, oftentimes we like to think like Leviticus is passe. We just ignore Leviticus. Well, Jesus is like, uh, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some verses from Leviticus and hang my whole ministry on them. So just go home and think about that. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Jesus attaches to this central prayer of Judaism that had more of a vertical emphasis. Make sure that you're good with God. Make sure that you're loving God. Make sure that you're obeying his laws. And he adds to it, no, no, love the people around you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Scott McKnight points out that there's another famous prayer, well-known prayer, that we believe that likely Jesus knew this prayer as well. It's called the Kaddish. And I'm not going to read it for you right now, but if you have the notes, you can find the notes for the sermon. Every week they're on the, actually the main page of the website. So if you just go to creekside.com, creeksidechurch.com, you'll, you'll see right in there the message notes, and you can read this prayer if you want to see it. And I just, I took that from you so that you go check out the notes. But the Kaddish had a sort of structure to it. And it kind of begins with like God's glory and may God's will be done and may his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven type language. And so McKnight points out in his book, The Jesus Creed, and many have pointed out after him, that it's almost like Jesus also amends the Kaddish. And what he adds to it is once again an emphasis on the other. He adds to it lines like, give us our daily bread today. Help us forgive one another. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. He adds to it a petition on behalf of others. Paul, who is a follower of Jesus, would do something even more dramatic the first time that you read it. When he begins to break down, what's the most important command? He takes Jesus' words and he's like, I can make them even shorter if you want. In Romans, he says this, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, whatever other command there may be, are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you might be like, Paul, 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 Jesus said two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so what, what is he doing here? Well, he just chopped off the first half of Jesus' words. I think it's pretty obvious what he's doing. He's saying, if you do this one, you'll do the other one. What it means to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is to love your neighbor as yourself. And just in case you thought this was a one-off, Paul does the same thing in his letter to the church in Galatia. He says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. What does it mean to be the church? What does it mean to be followers of Jesus? What does it mean to be Christ-like, to be these portals who bring the character of Jesus into the world? You cannot ever not include that what that means is to love your neighbor as yourself. And when we as a church, as a group of people do this, when we go out into the world and we sacrifice and we serve our neighbors, we find that God meets us there and does some incredible things. And what we end up with is some amazing stories of how God uses our faithfulness and our obedience to change people's lives. And I wanna show you two videos now. They're about six minutes long. So buckle up to watch a little, a couple videos. But as you hear these stories being told, I want you to put a new filter over them. We just watched a bunch of stories like this last week if you were here for Baptism Sunday. I want you to put a different filter over maybe how you listen to these. As they tell their stories, think about how many people were involved in each part of their story. Don't just hear them as like, oh, God's doing a whole bunch of things. Think about like when they mention a ministry, think about like how many people are involved in that ministry that were loving their neighbor as themselves. Check out these stories. Hi, my name is Roy. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I first came to the Lord in a Baptist church in a little village of Newstead. However, getting into teenage years and growing up, I decided that my way would be a more fun way. Drinking lots of alcohol, become addi uh, becoming addicted to alcohol, 
addicted to cigarettes, uh, whatever made me feel good, I wanted lots of. Hi, my name is Roy. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I first came to the Lord in a Baptist church in a little village of Newstead. However, getting into teenage years and growing up, I decided that my way would be a more fun way. Drinking lots of alcohol, become addi uh, becoming addicted to alcohol, addicted to cigarettes, uh, whatever made me feel good, I wanted lots of it. Came to Alcoholics Anonymous uh, is an answered prayer. Found some freedom in my life and freedom from alcohol, but because I didn't deal with root issues, uh, ended up uh, separating from my wife of many years. It was a low point in my life and, uh, and recognized that I wasn't uh, a Christian, the Christian that person that I thought I was. Um, I also have uh, a sister in my life that uh, invited me to go to a uh, Life's Healing Choices. That was uh, the beginning of uh, my healing. I started to become more aware that there was a God that wanted a relationship with me. But I realized I was in need of healing so much because I was really broken. At the same time, as I look back, that broken place was such a beautiful place because I needed to be there to be here and uh, he, I needed to be broken in order to need God and want God. Creekside, although I had been to Creekside before, it seemed like it was too big for me. It's just uh, a big church, so many people, I didn't think it was for me. Um, but however, I was uh, I committed to uh, Celebrate, or yeah, celebrate recovery meeting, and uh, uh, it was, so I was here at Creekside more, and uh, and actually started coming to Creekside on, a, and I committed to coming here on a regular basis every Sunday. When I look back at my life, uh, you know, he has walked with me, and he continues to walk with me and show me the way. I believe that uh, yeah, when I cried out in my uh, hopelessness uh, from alcohol that he led me to Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I believe that he brought me to celebrate recovery and to Creekside and uh, he puts all different people in my life. There, I look forward, like I, there's a few guys here that are huggy guys, I look forward to those hugs coming here. I'm also on the, the parking team and we have a nice little uh, camaraderie there also. And also I can come to Creekside and hear the message that is uh, shared here. Hi, I'm Kim. And I'm Craig. And we will be married for 32 years in February. And our journey um, started about probably five years ago. I became very depressed and was wondering how to do life um, and decided that I would try something totally different and I looked to God. Um, I picked up the Bible and then I decided I needed to go back to church. So I was looking around and my one friend suggested, hey, Creekside, you always said you liked the looks of it. Your daughter played soccer there and field hockey, so you know the place. I decided to go to Creekside and COVID hit and everything went online. I started a life group at the same time that I started COVID, like the online COVID stuff. I did um, our 50 plus group um, <laughs> with John Hill as our leader. I gotta put the plug. Um, when I wasn't doing it on my own, when I could lean on God, when I could walk with Jesus, when I could fall back and know, okay, I'm not in this by myself. Like, I don't have to rely on myself. I'm not good enough because look at the mess, you know, like it, it's it's amazing when you let God in and the difference he can make. 
Craig started after you started at church a little bit. Then he started coming to that life group. Life group. Um, and just the discussions and you've made a couple of very good friends. I saw a lot of beautiful things and a lot of beautiful changes through Kim and I will tell you I was very inspired and intrigued to want to explore what what Kim was seeing and what Kim was experiencing because it brought about great change and, and both of us needed probably change and comfort and we needed a lot of things to change in our lives so yeah it was like God was there when I started coming to Creekside I found great solace and great connection in being in the front row and I shed many tears there but it was a beautiful place for me to connect with exactly what was happening there was no distraction just the perspective to be able to be a part of a Christian community and get different ideas on how to live life and how to follow Jesus and how to serve. And Creekside just gives you so many opportunities to be able to do it in a good way. We've made a lot of good friends. Um, we serve with a lot of wonderful people. Like Creekside has provided, I would say, almost a second family for me. And it's a place that I love to come to every Sunday. If you can take God's love and let it shine through you, you will make a big difference in the people around you. It's awesome, right? I hear stories like this. Did you think, though, about all the people behind those stories? Like, I just, I went to a ministry, and then God was there, and he changed my life. Great, he probably was, and he changed your life, great. But how did that ministry happen? Somebody? sat down in front of a spreadsheet with people's names on it, with volunteers on it. They created a team. Somebody had to send out emails to get people there. Somebody else had to give financially so that when other people came, the lights would be on and the microphone would work and there'd be coffee to serve and snacks to give. Somebody else had to decide, I will get up early to be there. I'll, I'll, instead of just going to church on Sunday morning, I will, I will see it as like all of Sunday morning. I'll go to a service and I'll serve in the kid's wing for another service. All of the people behind these stories. And what we as a, as a leadership, anybody who's involved in the church here, what we want to see the most is just more stories like this. Last week, we had 15 baptisms, and we get to hear those 15 stories. There was a whole family, four people, a whole family got baptized together. And we just want to see more of those stories. So how do we do that? Maybe to flip the question, what could be in the way of us doing that? of us seeing more people here on a Sunday, but more people being served, more people serving on a Sunday. More ministries, more campuses, more people becoming more and more Christ-like. What, what could get in the way of that? What could get in the way of us loving our neighbor as ourself? Well, I think Jesus has a great story for us when it comes to asking that question. And I wanna tell this story that comes from Luke chapter 10 and then make some observations about it for us to think about. The story begins like this. An expert in the law comes up to Jesus. An expert in the law. And he's got a question. Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Whew, why don't you start with an easy one? What must I do? And Jesus says, well, you know the law. What does it say? And the man, the expert in the law, gives a very peculiar answer because he gives Jesus' answer. He gives the love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Which must mean that this guy had heard Jesus teaching before and he had like adopted that saying and, he, and then he spits it back to Jesus. And Jesus says to him, you have answered very well. Do this and you will live, which is a great little nuance. The man comes asking eternal life, which is meant to have like a quantity and quality aspect to it. Sometimes we hear it and just think the life after we die, but Jesus brings it right back down to earth. He's like, I wanna talk about here and now. Do these things 
And you won't just have hope for after you die. You'll begin to live fully here and now. The story says the man wasn't quite satisfied with where the conversation had got to. He wanted to justify himself. And so he says to Jesus, and just, just who is my neighbor, Jesus? And upon asking that question, Jesus launches in to this parable. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. And then Jesus turns back to the expert in the law and he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. We want to be followers of Jesus. We want to be Christ-like. I think Jesus gets at a lot of things in this story that might get in our way. So let me bring you a couple observations from it. The first one is this. Jesus, in telling this story, makes the hero of the story the enemy of the man who he's telling the story to. An expert in the law, a Jewish man, comes and asks Jesus for some teaching. And Jesus tells a parable in which his enemy, the Samaritan, is the hero. The Samaritans are the ones that there was a time when Jesus sent his disciples out to go and proclaim the good news of the kingdom to different towns and they go to Samaria and they're rejected there. And when they come back to Jesus, they say, Jesus, Samaria rejected us. Can we rain down fire on them? And they are pumped about the idea, the prospect that this might happen. This is how they feel about Samaritans. Wouldn't it be great to rain down fire on them? And Jesus tells a story when the Samaritan is the hero. Jesus also subverts a common storytelling technique. There's three people in the story that walk by the man who's on the side of the road. Let's say that he's in a ditch, right? The robbers come and and take his things and leave him bloody dying at the edge of the road in the ditch. And then three characters come by. The first one is a priest. The second one is a Levite. If you were following like Jewish social hierarchy, There is sort of a, if I had to guess who the third person would be, well, the priest is kind of like the head of the temple sacrificial system. They're going probably on their way to the temple. Then the Levite, the helper of the priest comes along. And then the third person, if I had to guess, who would that be? Uh, Maybe a teacher of the law? Maybe an expert in the law? As Jesus is telling the story, I wonder if the man, the expert in the law, isn't thinking, oh, I bet I'm about to show up in the story. Ooh, I wonder what I do in this story. I wonder if I'm the hero of the story. And then instead Jesus says, and then a Samaritan comes by. Which means for the man listening, I mean, he's trying to find himself in the story, right? That's what you do when Jesus tells a story. You try to find, where am I in this story, Jesus? And so the man's like, I'm not the priest. I'm not the Levite. I'm not a Samaritan. Who... Jesus, who am I supposed to be in this story? There's only one guy left. What is Jesus doing in just the the framework of this story? I think he's doing this. He's taking a man who came to him from a power position. A man who came to him saying, Jesus, who is my neighbor? Which is a question that says, who is it that I have to love? Which reversed would mean, who is it that I don't have to love? That's really the question. 
His question to Jesus is, who don't I have to love? Who am I allowed to walk by when I see them in life's ditch on the side of the road? That's really what the guy's asking. And Jesus tells a story that flips it all upside down and says, don't imagine yourself as the person walking by. Imagine yourself in the ditch. And realize that when you're the person in the ditch, you are no longer asking, I wonder who's allowed to help me. You're asking, will somebody help me? Anybody can help me. Even a Samaritan could help me. That would be great. Maybe Jesus tells this story for us today so that we'll do the same thing. Because we look at the world with the same sort of lens. Who are we supposed to help and who are we allowed to just not pay as much attention to? And Jesus is like, put yourself in the ditch and you'll stop asking that ridiculous question. Put yourself in the ditch. Remember when you were in the ditch. Realize that without my grace, you would still be in the ditch. Do you see how Jesus wants to just change? He takes our question and he goes, that's a dumb question. And he's like, here's a better way to look at the world. Observation number two. The priest and the Levite walk by the man on the road because presumably they're on their way to fulfill their God-instructed duties in the temple to be a part of the sacrificial system, something that God ordained and put in place and likely called these men to be a part of. Which means that for a Jewish person hearing this story, it is not as scandalous as we hear it when they walk by him. They are walking by him because they literally have more important things to do. Jesus, we're called to be a part of the sacrifice. You anointed us. Like we're part, this is what we have to do. We have more important things to do, Jesus. Don't, don't we? And it reminds you of lines that you find throughout the Bible that sound a little bit like this. More than sacrifice, God desires mercy. Yes, he he did call you to do this thing, but that important thing should never get in the way of this even more fundamental important thing that you love your neighbor as yourself. And so perhaps the question for us this morning to ponder is, where are you telling God I got more important things to do. And you really believe it. But you're wrong. I thought about this part of the sermon and all the examples that I could give right now. But I don't want you to feel like I, like I have the ability to do that to you. Like, I don't know what your level of sacrifice is or should be or where God is calling you to, to sacrifice and, and serve. But I think what we all need to do is every once in a while sit with God and ask him, God, am I making some things in my life more important than they need to be? Have I placed some things in my life, in my family's life, in the lives of my kids who I am the primary discipler of and I'm teaching them these things are actually more important than church? Is there anywhere where you're like, I got really important things to do and they have, they have messed up the right orientation in your life? Third observation. Jesus changes this man's two questions. It comes with two questions, right? The first one, how do I get eternal life? Second one, who is my neighbor? Which is really, who don't I have to love? And so I'd like to say that this man's two questions are two of the most selfish questions that you could ask. How do I get from God a nice life after I die? And who don't I have to love in order to get that life? Jesus is like, whew, we got some work to do. And by the end of Jesus' teaching, I'd like to say that he fixes the man's question. He doesn't answer his questions. He gives him a new question. What does Jesus say? Who was a neighbor to the man who fell among thieves. The one who showed him mercy will then go and do likewise. What he's doing is shifting this man from a posture of how do I get from God to a posture of how do I be like God? 
which is the journey of transformation that each one of us take. We all come to God as consumers. I need to get something from God. I need to be saved. I need to be restored. I need to be redeemed. We all begin in that posture. And yet while, he, while we begin there, he then begins to work in our life and transform us so that we don't just desire to get from God, but we desire to be like him, to be Christ-like, to be portals who bring the life of heaven into the life of earth. Do you need to make that shift? Ah, I, I am just kind of like a consumer. I do just kind of like attend. And you need to have Jesus awaken in you a desire to really be like him. One last observation is that I think this parable can act as an allegory for us that paints a beautiful image of what the church could be. An allegory is when you look at a story and you you begin to say like every part of this story is actually symbolic for something else. And just so you know, in the history of Christianity, we've done this with many teachings and we mess them up because we allegorize things we shouldn't allegorize. But other times when applied correctly, you can begin to see some beauty in a story that you otherwise wouldn't see. And I think that it applies well to this parable of Jesus. The man who fell amongst robbers could be symbolic for broken humanity. Broken, fallen, sinful, in a pit of their own making humanity, bleeding out on the side of the road, helpless to save themselves. And who comes by? The law comes by. The temple sacrificial system comes by. Religion comes by. And it is helpless to help him. It is more preoccupied with other things. It is useless to this man. And then who comes by? The Samaritan. The enemy of the man. In biblical terms, and this sounds weird for us today, but the enemy of God is fallen humanity. The enemy of fallen humanity comes by. And you might expect, well, if this is, if this is maybe representative of God, well, God looks at fallen sinful humanity and is like, good, that's where you belong, and keeps on walking. But instead, this figure does the most surprising thing and displays the most incredible mercy to the man. The Samaritan in the story is symbolic for Jesus. Jesus is the good Samaritan. He, he hides himself in his own parable. And then what does he do? He, he pours oil on the man and he bandages up his wounds and he puts him on his own donkey and he brings him to an inn. What is the inn symbolic for but the church? The place where Jesus brings broken people lost people, lonely people, and he deposits them and he says, take care of them. And one day I will return. I think Jesus wants us as a church to be finding the lost, lonely, broken people in the world and bringing them into the church. And when we do this, it will cost us it costs the Samaritan in the story. It costs him an inconvenience. It costs him his actual money. And when we want to be like the good Samaritan, Jesus, it will cost us as well. And so to end this morning, let me ask you a couple questions. Who is it this year that you are being called to love as you love yourself? Who is it? Who who are you being called to invite? Creeks out of the movies is next year, or is next week. Christmas Eve will come. Easter will come. There'll be different ministries happening. There'll be different events around the church. Who are you being called to? I need to invite them. And when you invite them, don't just think this is just a thing. No, this is loving your neighbor by inviting them. This is seeing your neighbor as someone by the side of the road who could use help and say, hey, hey, let me bring you to this place that I know can restore people because it's restoring me. How can you 
love your neighbor as yourself. Perhaps it's going to be by serving somewhere, by saying, I don't, I'm not just going to come on Sunday morning anymore. I'm going to serve somewhere. And what's amazing about being a part of such a big church is that there's a ton of ways to be involved. There's a ton of different things, everything from, from tech opportunities to being in the children's ministry to different ministries happening throughout the week to preaching on stage on Sunday, if you want. No, that one's a little bit trickier, but there's so many different ways to get involved. Maybe though, for some of you, it'll be this, and this is always the harder one to talk about, but maybe it'll be beginning to give financially to the church. I tried to point out earlier, when we see stories like we saw today, that behind those are people that gave. There's people, many people who give 10% of their income to the church. If you've never heard that before, that sounds like crazy. And yet for people that have become faithful followers of Jesus, that's just like, of course, of course. There's other people in the church who give more than 10%. And so maybe this year for you, it will just begin to take a, a first step to like, what would 1% look like? If you're already at 1%, what would 2% look like? If we did that, the impact that we would have on this region, on our province, would be, we would go through the roof if we had people that thought about giving in those terms. But whatever it is that you do, my prayer is that this year you would move beyond just attending on a Sunday that you would truly become and see yourselves as portals of the life of heaven into the life of earth, that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and you would do that by loving your neighbor as yourself, and that you would constantly have on your heart the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Abba, Father, Holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May the life of heaven begin to invade the world through your people, the church. Give us today our daily bread. For those who do not know where their next meal is coming from, may the church be the answer. May your people be the answer. And help us to forgive. Help us to have this supernatural ability to bring mercy and grace into the world. And would you lead us? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We pray all these things as yours, the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Jesus, we love you. Amen.